by the end of the webinar, you will have the tools you need to learn how to scale your team by getting the budget that you want. And I want to say this is not just about the budget process, but a lot of it has to do with how you communicate your value to your management team. So if you're not responsible for the budget plan, you definitely want to stick around because we're going to teach you a lot of really good stuff here today. What would you do if you had a bigger budget? And what I would like to do is to fire off a call so that you can see uh, how is everybody else uh, you know, I'm going to give you some options, but it's just another thing uh, we could potentially look into that a little later, and uh, we can talk about the different options that we typically see customer success executives spend their money on. So here's what we see. We have 27% of you would hire more CSMs, and 37% of you would invest in a new customer success operation system. And I would say, like, I would include in that also, like, generally tools because that will make your team more productive and about a quarter of you would hire a CSO. Asking for a budget is almost like an art form. There's lots of different things that play around, people you need to work with, things that you need to learn how to do in the right way. So it's not something that's straightforward that you put on an Excel spreadsheet, ask for a number, and you be granted. And I think most of you know you can work, work, work on, you know, your templates and your sheets, and then your your team is busy doing stuff. And you know, if you don't get the budget, it's going to be tough. Well, some of you would say, well, how come you're an expert on this? Well, probably I'm not, but I will tell you that once upon a time, before I did customer success. I actually worked at PWC as an accountant. I then, for a few years, implemented budget and planning systems for various companies, and I worked with CFOs very, very closely to understand that process and then embedder it with systems. And then I joined uh, the customer success movement. So that's my uh, little bit on why am I any kind of authority to say anything about this uh, process. And I've been doing games, you know, customer success uh, since 2013. And I've been helping a lot of different companies get better at customer success, whether it's getting the budget or their strategy or tools to scale their team. So today, I am not a single consultant. I actually have a really cool team in place where we help a bunch of customers implementing systems and improve their strategy. And we'd love to, of course, work with anybody that needs our help. We do strategy, we do technology, we speak at a lot of events, we do a lot of thought leadership, and we would love to extend our practice. If you need help, just reach out. I'm done with my pitch. All right, let's learn how to get the budget you need to scale your customer success team, because it just doesn't happen overnight. There's a systematic process and tools you can use. And I can tell you, from my years of being a management consultant for customer success teams, there's one thing that I learned is that templates and processes do work. There's essentially two phases, if you think about it, for the budget process. Phase one, the plan for it. And then phase two, when you're done with all your planning, then you're in a position to ask for it. I bet some of you skip through one of these phases or don't do enough of it. So in phase one, essentially, we're going to dig in and think about what are the critical steps that we need to take before we even ask for a budget. How do we, should we demonstrate our value, collaborate with other teams, align with a CEO? I'm going to show you exactly the most effective way that you can plan towards uh, that second phase of the actual ask. And within the ask phase, uh, Carolee and I are just going to really show you exactly how this uh, works technically. Even uh, to the point, we're actually going to show you a spreadsheet uh, and how you can put your numbers together in order to get a spreadsheet that actually convinces your management team that whatever budget you put in actually has merit and it has length. Uh, and it's just not numbers you came up with. All right, so let's go to phase one, the plan. So the first thing that you want to do is really think about what do you really need your budget for? And what I've seen, most customer success executives spend the money on either getting systems or people in place. And this is just like a holistic list of 
you know, what it is that you could spend your money on. This is what we're seeing typically. It's uh, really uh, amazing how we could uh, think about the different tools that we need to scale the team because we don't get the resources, the budget that we need to hire more uh, team members. We might want to look into getting systems in place so that the team can scale. I want to add another poll here and see what, what is it that everybody here is kind of thinking about uh, in terms of budget span for this year specifically. So I'm going to share this with you. Not surprising, most of you think about tools and software. Okay, so now I'm going to show you a few things that I actually asked around some other executives of customer success. How do we help the, you know, everyone in the community avoid junior mistakes in asking for a budget? And the main answer that I got is that step number one, we need to align with our company's goals. We need to define what the team's goals are and make sure that they are aligned with the overall strategy. So here's what I typically see. I typically I talk to customer success leaders and they have these goals of, oh, we want to communicate with more customers. We want to reduce, you know, whatever it is. And it's not necessarily aligned with what the CEO's top of mind is. So the step number one is, as much as it's nice to have goals for the internal team, you want to make sure that your CEO endorses you for what is the customer experience that you're trying to promote? What is the, um, the company's goals in terms of numbers? What does the CEO care about? And how can you support him in that or her in that? And for that, there's like three metrics that you can focus on. We call those the three R's. And I've actually published a blog about that if you wanted to read more about it. But the gist of it is, and this came from Jeff Piper, who's a chief customer officer and founder at Spring CM. And so he kind of came up with this three R's, which is referral, referenceability, and retention. And these are the three things that he actually demonstrates to the board. And what's nice about these three metrics is if you look at it, they not only help with existing clients, but they promote new business as well. And this is just like a, some screenshots from that board template where you can see how he displays the high level metrics to the board. And this is how he aligns himself with the CEO and the overall company goal. So this is just an example. You're welcome to follow it or have a conversation with your executive team to make sure that you are aligned as well. The three R's can also help develop alignment with other key team members. Referrals, references are super important to sales and marketing and R&D. How is that related to getting more budget? That really leads up to step two. You need to plan ahead like a pro. If you need additional resources and tools and systems, there's a lot you can do to get collaborated with other team members to get the budget that you need. You can tag team with a sales team. If, for example, you need additional resources that both of you can use. You can tag team with marketing teams. If you want to create like somebody here said, a CS community, they would love to collaborate with you or advocacy. These are the teams that would support you in getting these things, and they typically have a bigger budget surprise. So think about having these sessions with these teams ahead of time from either additional systems or additional resources. So I'm going to share an example with you. I had a conversation with Paul Piazza. Paul has started his customer success team at Marketo. He then moved to various other companies, and today he's VP customer success at OnePager, which is a public company. And he tells this story that, hey, when I worked for a different company, he, he needed a CS operations manager. But that was a different company, not OnePager, but he needed somebody, and his budget was a lot smaller back then. He could only afford somebody that's very junior. And then he had a conversation with a sales team because these skills are actually relatable. They ended up sharing the budget for a new ops manager who handled both customer success and the sales ops, and they were able to hire a much more senior person that benefited both teams. Other things that you can do to justify the need for additional resources is to do a staffing assessment. And this is just an example of how a very simplified staffing model could look like. Carolee, do you do staffing model? Yeah, we have a detailed staffing model. And actually, we'll go through a little bit later and mm -hmm. show you an example of how we think about that. But that's really tied to the first 
comment that you made, Ari, which yeah. is around what was the vision for the company and what are we trying to execute to? And alignment around that and then how we measure that really then drives out what we look at from a staffing plan. We have a pretty detailed and sophisticated one because we have an awful lot of customers for uh, a company that still uh, is a startup with more than 3,500 customers. And then in a conversation you and I had before this webinar, you mentioned you also do Racy charts. Yes, I, so it relates probably less to us from a staffing perspective mm -hmm. than just thinking about what are the roles within the whole organization. And those metrics that we talked about are one of the things I'm thinking about from a customer success perspective. How do we track? For me, it's really, really important what we communicate, whether it's to the development team in terms of what's happening on the product side that we track and report back out, right, and inform them uh, of that and the actions that we need them to take versus product marketing and the messaging and what's resonating and so on. So any questions from the audience about staffing models or uh, racy charts? Does anyone have a good Excel template? Yes, we're going to share one in a few minutes here. Okay, so now I want to talk about getting the budget for customer success tools since this seems to be top of mind. And I talked to Paul about this. The most successful way that he is approaching asking for budget for tools is, first of all, make sure you bake that process fully. Really understand how to do this even manually, and a lot of you may gasp at that, but when you understand the process and you're able to execute it manually, even if it's super inefficient, you will be able to, first of all, show some success in how this process is working really well and demonstrate that asking to make this process a lot more efficient has merit. Now, this also helps, you know, if you use a tool that shows results or, you know, you use a manual process that shows results and you demonstrate your success, whomever you're serving, whether it's additional referrals, advocacy, you know, whatever the process is or shore, shore up some upsell opportunities, will help the person that you tag teams with sort of beg for more. So if I had a survey that I did with, I don't know, you know, uh, some, some other tool, and it's not the most optimized one, but I was able to identify upsell opportunities or extension for services, or I was able to rescue some more churn uh, clients, what if I could use a better survey tool, you know, and make it more automated, then I can serve up and shore up even more results. So this is a great process to actually get the budget that you need doing things step by step. And that goes back to phase one, plan before you ask. Any questions here, uh, Matilda? Going back to the staffing model a little bit, but it does relate to automation. So uh, Curtis is asking, if I automate, I should be able to save costs by hiring less expensive personnel. Absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, and sometimes it just takes an extra few steps to get everybody aligned with uh, placement. And so sometimes we need to show and we need to have other people realize that the process is inefficient. If I get X results and then they say, oh, can you get more results? I can say, yes, I can, but I need a tool. Carolyn, do you res does that resonate with you? Yeah, that absolutely does. And I think, sorry, interrelated to that comment is the aspect of there's an element of what what is really differentiated about what you can deliver. So for me, I think about the aspect of automation, and certainly it affects my staffing costs, but sort of what can I get, what's the benefit that I can get out of an investment like that that really then allows me to, uh, you're talking about sort of what the metrics are around, around the business of saying, how do I drive the high value element, right, and sort of automate the parts that are low value, but drive an experience for the customer, et cetera. So that's a really important thing that we think about for sure. So let's get down to phase two. How do you actually prepare for the budget app if you've never done it before or you want to do it like a pro? And so before we dig in, I want to show you a little bit what Carol Lee has actually been able to achieve since she joined Adaptive. And so, Carol Lee, when you started, how big was the team at Adaptive for customer success? Yeah, so it really focuses around the CSM role and those directly reporting that. So it was about 16 people sort of 18 months ago, just to give you a sense of the, the feel. And there was an operations role that kind of blended in what is operations versus mm -hmm. also sort of 
customer success coach, which was someone to sort of help customers. And that was merged into sort of two teams, as you see sort of reflected here. And how long have you been working with Adaptive? <laughs> I've been at Adaptive for about four and a half years now. And I've been responsible for this area for about 18 months. Okay. And so since then, how did the, how did your team change? Yeah, so I mean, it's, the organization has sort of roughly doubled if you think about overall. I think the key things in terms of the way in which that's happened, and we'll talk a little bit when we get to staffing, but it's also just structurally, sorry, I realize there's a lot of things going on here in the picture, but it, it really discreetly established a team that was around enablement or what is the success, folks who have technical skills that are deeper than our CSM. So that was kind of one of saying that's a discrete team. We also sort of segmented from that a program team. And that program team lives a lot with what the questions have been around sort of operations and tools. But both of those teams for me are just critical and it was an important part of the sales positioning too overall what are we trying to build to say what are the foundational aspects that you need to have in an organization mm -hmm. to drive to scale, to cover 3,500 sort of customers as we have over that. And so both of those were really important kind of roles and that was some of and then there were some decisions that we chose to make around establishing pause and focusing in certain geographies. And then that, that's one of the things that really drives back to the start of what you talked about, which is how you plan. And that really drives back to vision. And I think I probably, it's a little unfair, so I'm glad to be here in the sense that, so as a company, we sell to CFOs every day. So this aspect of sort of positioning a budget and how do you do it is part of our basic gig. And so in that, I think I get a lot of sort of runs at that and a lot of at that in that kind of role. So happy to kind of share that experience with, with everyone here today. So as you can see, she expanded the team quite a bit from both resources, CSOP, and software. And so when you've got all these additional resources from, from the time that you got the team, can you tell me a little bit about that process? And maybe you can start with what was first up of mind? Like what did you tackle first? How did you get everybody riled up to get that budget approved, or were they already synced in with your vision? So I start with probably the most important thing, or right before I ever got to any of those other things, was to drive a sense of vision. So I'm really blessed, lucky. I'm in a company where our founder is still here, was a CFO who had this problem. So there is a huge affinity organizationally to the customer. And so in that element, it was, there is this great sort of general vibe of we like customers, customers are important to us. What it meant was how do we grow that was the critical first part was really around driving a vision more globally about how does that translate into what we really want our customers' experiences to be like? Mm -hmm. And how do we think about our customer base, who they are in a way that's both relevant to them but that is also impactful to us from a business perspective. And this really gets into the whole CFO and the budgeting part because all, I'm sure all of you are committed to delivering a great experience for your customers and all of us have constraints around that. And so how we do that is really important around saying, okay, what does great look like for a particular profile of customers? How do we think about that? What do we want the experience to be? For us, Thinking about that investment saying, what do we want their experience to be like depending on that investment makes sense for us as a business. And that's the piece that probably drives for me into the most important thing. So getting this picture together that says, what does great look like for our company around customer success? And part of that is an emotional part of that. And part of that is the financial piece of that. So the next part of that is, great, we all have this picture. We want our customers to have a great experience. We spent some more time really solidifying thinking about those customers, and trying to decide what we want the experience to be around them. So when you say customer experience, does that mean that you've actually defined the customer journey, the stages, the playbooks, and made sure that the CEO was aligned with you on that vision? So from the start, it didn't mean we had playbooks in the way that many of you guys will think about that. What it did absolutely mean, though, is we thought holistically of from sort of hopefully birth to rebirth, right, of the customer sort of continuing this ongoing cycle of what that experience for them would be like, for sure. But that actually, we didn't have playbooks built out for all those points or what that experience would be like. But it was really, again, sort of at that global level of saying, hey, are we all committed to this? What does great look like? And that 
so that's the first thing, sort of drive the vision. And you guys all as customer success leaders kind of own that. Own that. Mm -hmm. uh, the next so critical piece for us is really then aligning to the corporate plan. Now you got to fund it, right? So then you get to the constraint, uh, the constraint part. And so for us, being a company that does planning as well, so the great news is we do have a plan. I'm sure you do. Ours is a fairly sophisticated plan that really models out four years. What are we looking to grow in terms of new ARR? What does that mean in terms of logos? What do we expect that complexion to look like? What size of those customers? And then what is the complexion look of this big existing customer base? We've been blessed, right? That customer base has grown and grown. It's a huge part of our, our business, retaining those customers. What do we expect to do from a retention rate? So you talked about that earlier. How does that retention rate, if we alter that or increase that, we know the ramifications of that. So really going through and saying, okay, what is the corporate plan? What is the company plan growing? Because we've already agreed on what great should look like, depending on our complexion of customers. So if we're growing in this way, back over to sort of how do you continue to support, what do we need to do? What should we expect? And that really sets up for me like the next critical thing, which is defining the metrics of what are the metrics. And all of you may have some metrics that exist already, and clearly retention rate is a common one that will, I would expect you to have, your board to have expectations around. Beyond that, MPS is also really important to us. And we looked at retention in different segments, too, in a really granular way. And look at the behaviors of those customer pools. We actually even evaluate the retention rate and the experience of customers that work with partners of ours versus ourselves directly uh, versus through an OEM channel. So we've really spent a lot of time to say, what are the metrics? And to think through, what do we think are the leading indicators versus the lagging ones? So for us, an important part of that metrics began literally with just starting with an agreed upon definition of what was red, what was yellow, and what was green, because we honestly didn't have that. We sort of go like, hey, this one's really unhappy. Well, on what scale are they unhappy, right? And how important are they? So that was a really important part. So the metrics really go to that sort of foundational level because then you could begin to establish values of CS organization. How many people were red versus how many people are red now? How many people are yellow? What are the expectations even for the folks on your team? And, you know, we clearly highlight that tools are a really important part of how you automate a lot of that. So being able to classify that, and there's always going to be an element, or certainly there has been for us, as there is an element of the human intervention part of evaluating it, but there's a lot of automation that we've done that highlights sort of where would be red, where would be yellow, what are things that we should look at. Then if you've got, we agree on the vision, what we're trying to get to, we know what the company is trying to get to, what that means in terms of retention metrics, how many new customers are going to come in? Because that's the thing, right, on customer success, right? You guys are all doing well. You keep getting more of them, right? And how do you set the team's expectations to grow that says, hey, I don't just keep getting more customers and more customers with no more people coming in, or how are we handling that? So establishing a predictable model for that is really important. So for us, that is the next step is really then what that did in terms of building a plan for the team, and I know a number of you guys sort of had questions that related to that, which is one of the reasons why I brought Clee here to join me. As we sort of partner up with finance, that clearly is driven off of we have this financial plan. That financial plan, again, determines how many more customers we have, how many of those customers we plan to retain. And for us, you saw that org chart that had kind of all these tiers. Well, we have different ratios of people that we expect for certain sizes of mm -hmm. customers that we're projecting. And we also have different, what we call service levels that we're expecting to deliver. And so a big part of the buy-in ultimately too on some of the headcount when we'll go through and talk about the modeling exercise around that, really related to getting agreement on, hey, a customer this size, what is the service we want to be able to deliver? You saw, uh, it reached showed a little bit earlier kind of a, one to 30 or sort of, and you know, there's some vacation time in that model, et cetera. So we spent time that says, okay, how frequently do we want them to touch that customer? How deep do we want the plan with them to be? And we have some expectations around how long a time it would take to deliver that. Is it, okay, so to right side, someone could do that if they cover 20 customers or someone could do that if they cover 100. And we have ratios that go as high as 600 customers to person, right? So we have a really wide range, and that really ties back to say, okay, 
how much this can we automate? What is the level of service we want to deliver to those customers? And then we go off and we start building our plan, which is where Kui comes in. So, Matthew, do we have any questions for Carolyn? How do you balance looking for more people and for more technology? Because the comment here is that you have to be careful that tools usually require someone to implement them and maintain them. So how would you normally factor that into the budget itself? Tools absolutely require someone to administer them. Uh, in my experience and the way we built that out from our point of view is simply the aspect of thinking about what is what are we looking to automate and what is the effect that we expect it to be able to have. So when, we, when I think about the tools that we had, oftentimes there was an amount of drag across every single team member in the organization of something that they were doing in a manual way or separately tracking and back over to just sort of trying to establish that baseline. So I think one of the first things that is just setting up is it's not that we're not spending money on this already. In fact, we're probably spending it kind of efficiently across a lot of people doing a manual thing versus somebody coming in and administering a system, for example. I won't disagree, though, that there's probably a first hurdle, which is that one first headcount of saying, yeah, because it's probably, you know, maybe you can't say it's totally one full headcount across all those folks or it's a little soft to kind of justify that. And I think that's where, as a leader, the commitment to say, Here's what we're trying to deliver from an experience perspective that's really important, and here's the way in which this is going to raise the water line, because typically that investment will not only cover that manual piece that you've got spread around the organization, but it'll also cover the aspect of we're going to be able to do some things that we weren't able to do before. And that was one of the most sort of revolutionary aspects for us. It was, it was hey, everyone... We got to do what we did before. It was a little more efficient, and folks could focus on higher value activities. But it was some of the things that we couldn't do before that then we were and then able to do that then we were able to show more of a baseline for that really helped justify the continued growth. Great. Any other questions, Matthew? Exactly. What's the difference between the tiers? Mm. Yeah. So, um, and again, it may vary for some of your organizations. For us, and that was actually one of the big decisions that was made at the front end of driving a vision. So there's lots of different ways companies decide to segment their customers. In our particular case, we had had a variation that was a little fuzzy, and it was hard for the broader organization to understand. Uh, we opted with a model that is exclusively based on the ARR that they put with us. And so there's lots of, you know, discussions around that. Like, well, what about future opportunity and how do you look at that, et cetera? And so the tack was taken is like, sell your way into that problem. If you think that customer, right, needs some more support, we should sell our way into that situation by driving them up from an investment perspective in terms of delivering more value. So we have segmented by the ARR investment. Um, we also have some nuance that you might have caught in that slide that relates to the customers that have come to us as partners. So we staff those differently. We obviously commit, we do commission partners around that business. So all of this is really built on an infrastructure model that says, okay, what are our investments and what's our return, uh, our return on that? And we actually track retention rate by partner as well, et cetera, and have had great results with that. So our tiers are all driven off of an ARR, right? So what I'd like to do next is invite Kui to share some examples of uh, budget templates that she uses in supporting Carolee. Carolee, can you, before she does that, can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with uh, Kui? Yeah, so maybe a good setup about this is Kui is a part of our finance organization. And probably the best piece of advice I can advise you on is go make friends with your finance organization because they, in fact, know a lot about what is getting funded and what the plans are and the implications of the improved retention rate. So whether you're a smaller startup and managing the cash and the implications of that or a very large global uh, global business and a large global business for about seven years prior to this and the ramifications in the sense of their broader business portfolio. So making friends with finance is a really important part. And the setup to this is really around there is a lot of work that every company is doing around, again, what their overall financial plan is. And for you guys, that will relate to both the new bookings, and those new bookings are going to help drive more customers for you to be responsible for from a CS perspective, and then maintaining that base and ideally growing 
that base. And there's no one who will be a better advocate for you, frankly, than your CFO, because the implication of retention rate and very small moves and increases on retention rate or add-on sales are so impactful, right? CAC is inevitably higher if you're in a SaaS model of how, what does it take your customer acquisition cost to acquire that customer? So the value in saving them and incremental moves on that has a huge impact. And so your finance partner hopefully can help you understand that if you don't already have that visibility to that broader landscape. And so as we go through and build the whole financial plan that the entire company and the exec staff, when I sit there, everyone's buying off on their delivery of their piece, and they go, okay, how do I execute to support that? It turns out we've already agreed on a vision. We've already agreed on what those SLAs should be for accounts of different sizes. Now we move into, we talk on the, the, math, the math exercise around that that says, okay, we've agreed this is what the plan is, so what do we do? So the first thing I want to do with Carolee, and my goal is I need to get her headcount approved for the year. And so based on the corporate goal, I know this year I'm going to push for an additional four resources for Carolee. And that aligns with the strategic direction, the plan for the corporate plan. At Adaptive, we're a planning company, and so we use our own tools to plan. And this is actually a snapshot from our financial model. And so what this tells you is, so for fiscal year 2018, we're on a fiscal year calendar 18. We just moved it last year, so that's why you, you see it says 18. It says that we're expected and plan to have about 531 logos by these two channels. So you can see we've got direct and indirect channels. As a result of that, I'm going to need to get about four CSMs through the year in order for her to properly execute to the vision and to properly execute to that customer journey. So we go through a couple different things. We've got some logo distribution ratios. We've got how the logos are going to be distributed, distributed by tiers. And um, I call them gearing ratios, but they're kind of almost like a, you know, these, these, uh, staffing ratios. Across the organization, we have different metrics as well, you know, something like, you know, for every salesperson that comes in, you have X, Y, Z, other support layers. And so in, the, in, in this context, I call them gearing ratios, which is what you see on line 92 there. Got it. So just to translate what you said, in between line 100 and 106, essentially yeah. the entire exercise of the spreadsheet is to get to these numbers, which is the number of SPE per quarter that you need to hire. That's correct. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit of more about what the 0 0.3 looks like. But I think you, what you're saying next is to arrive to these numbers, you're looking at the total number of logos, meaning number of actual clients That's correct. that you're going to acquire, projected to acquire during the year. This is the number the sales have submitted to. And then you differentiate them by direct and indirect clients. And this, I guess, is connected directly to what Carol Lee says, there's a different staffing plan, whether they they were acquired by Adaptive or they're acquired by a partner. So because the CSM ratio, and for those who don't, don't know what a CSM ratio is, I really mean like how many customers uh, am I, the customer success manager, am going to have to cater to. So if you're in a strategic account, then you will have less customers because they're super big and it's, it's a smaller account then uh, you're going to have more clients that you probably need to handle and you'll have to introduce some information into it. But the gist of it is, is that you're saying, okay, to arrive to these SPE numbers, first of all, I look at the number of logos. Yeah, and let me, let me jump yes. in on that. This is Carol Lee again. So, right, it's the number of customers, where they're coming from. As mm -hmm. you pointed out, Uri, that relates to how many people I'm going to staff against those. And then it's what ARR do I expect to come from those? Mm -hmm. Right, so back over to like the metrics and the plan, I have the look back. I know what the distribution looks like. So it's not just the number of logos, it's how many dollars, what size are those customers going to be, because those also relate to the way in which I will staff. This slide is kind of opening up some of those areas that I closed in the early slide. So you notice at the top, that's still our goal. We've got 531 customers. So one of the things that Carolee talked about is then, how does that distribute across some of our segments? And I think Miles asked about the differences in tiers. You'll see here, we've got a couple of tiers. Uh, we've got market segments. First of all, we've got 
SMB segments, mid-market, and enterprise. Within those market segments, we've got your tiers. And so Carolia uh, talked about we have tiered our customers by their ARR contribution. So you'll notice there's tier, there's some dollar amount attached to tier one, two, three, and four. And so those, those are our tiers. When you move across the time through the year, we expect X amount of logo win by this segment by these tiers. And these are the ratios of when approximately some of those logos are going to come in through the year. So a couple of questions. First yeah. of all, these numbers here, the percentages, but I assume that the dollar amount associated with each tier is coming from the sales team. That's correct. And then the reason you break it down. Yeah, I need to be more specific, right? Yeah. Ultimately, our financial plan. So back over mm -hmm. this, this webinar is about delivering budget. Right. It's not just the sales plan. It's the financial budget of the company. So, for okay. example, our sales plan is higher than what our company has tied off to on a budget. But I'm going to staff to the company budget. And one of the pieces that all of you will be dealing with, and you, you asked to read about our point three and sort of when do we hire, right, relates to the great piece about doing this kind of legwork first means if your business accelerates, you have the numbers that support when you pull forward or execute to hire, and you know when you if, if you slow down, unfortunately, you'd be like, here's where we'll hold, and we'll push this out, because it all ties back to those numbers. So as you can see here, we go to market, this reflects, you were asking about the sales piece, or we go to market around size of customers, which is different than how much they spend with us. So we've done a good job of sort of dimensionalizing or thinking about the variants that tie back to our plan. So we go to market around SMB, smaller customers. As everyone can see here, we expect 0% of tier one customers to come from a small customer is what this tells you. But so this has been built out for each of those sections. So your CSM ratio is really tied to the segment SMB. No, no. It is tied to the ARR investment to each tier, right? So we have an SLA that says depending on how much investment the customer tiers. is making. So you could have, yeah, we have five tiers. So you could have a customer that's a huge global company with a very small investment, mm. and they would be back over to us and sell your way to the problem. They would be in the lowest tier for us. You could be a monster company, but you have a small investment. You're going to be SMB tier five. And you're going to have a different customer. You, you are going to have a different a experience. Different ratio. You are going to have a different ratio for that. We have a separate right sales execution that is around upselling, right? right those mm -hmm. accounts. So, so they will potentially have more upsell flavor. They clearly would have a lot of potential yes. in upsell in an account like that. Interesting. Okay. Why is there a percentage here in the middle? It's the distribution of when the logos come out throughout the year. Okay. So for example, you notice the direct channel has, uh, we're anticipating about 308. So based on the dis distribution percentages, we know those 308 in line 56 right there, we know at each quarter mm -hmm. per market segment per tier how much is going to come in through the year. And then what I do is I apply those steering ratios and staffing ratios in line 93 and below. T1 and T2, these 20 and these 50 and these 150 means for every 20 of those accounts that come in, those strategic T1, T2 accounts, we are anticipating hiring about one T1 CSM. Okay, so in other words, in line 94, 20 means a 1 to 20 ratio of like the CSM okay. ratio, essentially. Mm -hmm. that's right. Okay, that's correct. Right. Yeah. And so mathematically what happens here is it goes back to the spreadsheet where we say, all right, so in the direct channel, purely mathematically, I'm saying you're going to need 0.3 people. And this is this is the science of it. Right. And so Carolee will apply her art on top of that to talk to, to kind of round out the conversation. Right. So when do you actually hire? Yeah, so on this, what I would go and say, I will hire somebody in Q1 for example, here, because it will take me some period of ramp time, which we've also agreed to in our model of how long that will take. Um, also, one of the other pieces as, we, you know, back over, sometimes the art of getting the deal is partly the science of showing you've done your homework. And so part of what the investment is around is saying, 
we have different comp structures for those different tiers and those roles and what they're delivering. And so to say, hey, there's real intelligence around, like, and it eases the conversation, right, tremendously when you're talking about a financial model. And so going to say, hey, there is a ramp period for someone in this, in this role. And what we want to do, the way we approach sort of onboarding someone, so rather than giving someone, hey, here, right, here's your whole book of a business, here's 100 accounts, go figure it out. If we're adding somebody new based on new logos, we can actually start them in a ramping thing mm -hmm. and start as we're acquiring customers, you're picking up a few at a time, right? You're getting your feet wet, et cetera, until you build to a full ramp. So you have another line here in the success spreadsheet or uh, your online model that actually says, all right, this is how how all, you know how fast we're actually going to hire. Like That's right. Hire. So we have a personnel plan, yeah. right? Back over to sort of how do you how do you build these? Is so mm -hmm. here's the financial modeling behind it, and then I say, here's my personnel plan. Yeah. Here's what role it's going to be, here's the comp for that role, here's the date I expect to hire them. Again, it all it all ties back to the financial model. That's awesome. Um, Matthew, do we have any questions? Matt is asking, can you elaborate further on the upsell resources you mentioned? If you have an enterprise customer with low ARR, i.e. Re receiving tier 5 service, how do you then give them more resources to get higher ARR? Yep, so great, great question. And so the way we've chosen to approach this, and actually this is really a highly dynamic area, as you guys all know from a customer success perspective. So our CSC, they carry quota associated with retention, and they have sort of this or opportunity to look for and identify upsell opportunities. And certainly if a customer is buying more stuff, they'll be stickier. So that will relate to their results. But we have chosen to separately segment the actual add-on sales to say someone's job for us from a CS perspective is really around enabling and driving out the footprint. So we staff out the additional resource around the upsell separately based on another sales model. So that sales model relates to how much add-on do we want to do, what's the ARR carry that we have by role for someone who is doing add-on sales, but it is segmented from this pool. So before we just wrap this webinar up, for me the biggest thing is drive the vision. Alignment with the executive team around what does great look like. Then you, you better tie it to your financial plan and you should define the metrics that you're going to use. And that is probably one of the most powerful things of being able to go back and report against that and get more sophisticated over time. And I don't do anything about the plan for the team until I've not locked out those first three. Then, of course, it's, yeah, like deliver the goods, right? In the end game, it's, you show the results, which actually sort of really reinforces, and then it's like you're in the chance to lose, right? Yep. So in rinse and repeat. And it's really time to just write down the budget that you need to, to in order to scale, to collect. Think about which other team members you want to collaborate with in order to get that budget. Think of ways you can tap into their budget eventually or share one with them. Bottom line is proper planning, collaborating, demonstrating value, and aligning with your executive team will help you be on your way to getting the budget that you need in order to scale your team and really take care of your customers in the most efficient manner. There's nothing that I share with you is theory. Every single one of these strategies has been proven by other customer success executives who secured a larger budget, and um, they uh, did allow their teams to scale and provide the customer experience, the upsell, the advocacy, the loyalty, everything that we want as customer success managers. I'm also happy to read if anyone has questions. You guys have my Twitter, uh, Twitter logo there at the front end or connect yeah. me on LinkedIn. Happy to answer awesome. questions about our specific experience. Yeah. Customer success. You want to nail it, bring it over. We do at CSM practice. Uh, we have software services and strategy services. So if you need any help, bring it on. You can follow me or my company on Facebook. I encourage you to read our blog. There's a lot of supplemental information for this particular webinar. And, of course, track us on Twitter because we always publish new webinars and presentations and live events that we get um, involved with. This is uh, just as a reminder, our personal Twitter. If you wanted to follow up uh, or with Carolee with any question or myself, of course, we'd love to hear back from you. Thank you so much for uh, attending this webinar. Matilde, on to you.
Awesome. Thank you so much for that presentation. If you want to learn more about MD and what we do, we're a customer success management software, and we help CSMs retain and grow their customers. And so if you want to head over to our website, you can request a demo, and we would love to show you what we do. Thank you so much, everyone, for being with us today. Thanks so much for taking the time. And Irit and Carol Lee, thank you so much for sharing all of that information with us. It was really incredible.